there. My name is Corinne O'Flynn, and you're listening to the Calm Entrepreneur Podcast. I am a USA Today bestselling author, nonprofit executive, and organizing nerd with over 20 years experience running my own small businesses. I teach entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, and small business owners like you how to organize your business, find more time, and deepen your alignment practice to experience more calm and confidence every single day. If you're looking for that intersection between practical business advice and spiritual goodness, then you're in the right place. So sit back, relax, and let's dive into this week's episode of the Calm Entrepreneur Podcast. Welcome, welcome to the Calm Entrepreneur Podcast. I'm your host, Corinne O'Flynn, and this is episode 15. So this week, I wanted to talk about the very exciting topic of website legal and policy requirements that all businesses need. So if you hear those words and you want to run off to the hills and throw away your computer and dismantle the whole thing, you know, you are not alone. You and I will be running together holding hands um, because I don't know what it is about hearing the words like legal compliance that just sends shivers down my spine. And it's like no joke. Right. And and I do my best to be in compliance whenever I do anything. Right. I think most of us do. Um. So if this is one of those things that has just been overwhelming, like instantaneously, you hear the words, oh my gosh, you need to update your website for these legal requirements. And then instantly you're like, oh, overwhelmed, can't deal with it. It's something that you need to take care of. And whether or not you handle your business website uh, management yourself, you need to be aware of what's required so that you can make sure that the person handling your website for you is doing the things that need to be done. So Before I go any further, I would like to let you know that you don't have to take notes on this. I'm going to put as much of this as I possibly can in the show notes on my website, which will be available at corinneoflynn.com forward slash episode 15. And that's the word episode and the digits one five. And in addition to having everything that I share here on my website, I'm also going to be hosting a masterclass in the near future. I don't have a date for it yet. But I'm going to have a sign up if you wish to be notified when that comes available. Um, And that will also be linked in my show notes. So if that has any interest for you, go ahead and sign up. And signing up will just be notify you when it goes live. You're under no obligation, of course, if the time doesn't work for you. So the legal requirements of business websites varies depending on your location, the location of your customers, the industry that you're involved in, and the kind of data that you collect from your visitors. And as you hopefully are aware by now, there are some pretty strict regulations concerning data privacy. There are laws that require certain things about how you handle the data that you collect, as well as how you disclose that you're doing so. And these laws are meant, of course, to provide users with the right to know and to control what personal data is being collected, sold, and shared. And websites must provide the means for visitors to know or they risk being out of compliance. And, you know, we all understand this. As, as business owners, it's, it's hard to, to know that you're in compliance at all times. And it's one of those things, like I said, sends shivers down my spine whenever I think about it. I'm like, oof, I have to do a check. Am I in compliance? How do I know? Where do I go? But as a user, we understand why, right? We don't want our data out there. Like, not being cared for, not being protected, not being managed the way they promise it's being managed. So, you know, as much of a hassle as this could potentially be as a business owner, we understand the need for it. And it's just good business, right? We want to take care of our clients and our website visitors so that they trust us, right? This is, this is you know, this is our business, right? And it's our, it's our integrity that's on the line here. So, you need to make sure that you do the right thing when it comes to your business. And if you are doing business online, that means you have a website. And that means that there are several things that you need to be aware of in order to stay compliant and to follow best practices. So before I begin, let me state for the record that I am not a lawyer and that you should not take any of my information as legal advice. And again, I'll be hosting a masterclass in the near future to cover all of these things. And I'll have a sign up to be notified link to my show notes, which again is at corinnoflynn.com forward slash episode 15. Okay, so without further ado, let's get into it. If you have a website, or if you're thinking about building a website, you're going to need to be aware of the following laws, regulations, and best practice policies. And luckily, 
for us today, many of the turnkey website builders like WordPress and um, Squarespace, a lot of these have this stuff built in or available to you using plugins. So make sure that you take advantage of any kind of tutorials or knowledge base uh, libraries at your hosting company to make sure that what you're using is, you know, in compliance or that you're actually aware of what's available to you. So that's something that a lot of people tend to resist doing. But, you know, with the WordPress knowledge base, holy smokes, you guys. And I know that Squarespace has something similar and Wix has something similar. So take advantage of the things that are available to you because those are usually available free of charge or as part of the service that you're paying for. So I'm going to cover the data policies laws and what they mean for you and your business. And I'm also going to go over some other policy requirements that are available for online businesses. And this list is not exhaustive. So I'm not going to cover things related to medical or bodywork businesses or financial. But depending on when you listen to this episode, there is a chance that the laws have changed. So this episode is going to be airing, I believe, in early April 2023. So Please use this as a starting off point and make sure that you do your due diligence and make sure that you are checking all the boxes for your industry and your location. So the first set of uh, regulations and laws I wanted to cover have to do with data privacy. And the first one is one that has been in the news in the last several years. It's called GDPR. And those initials stand for General Data Protection Regulation. And that's for the EU. And it was implemented in 2018 to allow EU citizens control over their personal data and companies that legally hold that data, what they can and cannot do with it. So if your website is based outside of the EU, this still applies to you. Because if you offer goods or services to people located in the EU, in the islands, in Norway, Liechtenstein, Switzerland, or the UK, you must comply with all of the laws covered by the GDPR regulation. So that's just about everybody, right? If you're selling something online and somebody from any one of those in the EU can, can access your website, this means you, right? So complying with GDPR starts with a comprehensive privacy policy that details what, how, when, and where data is collected, okay? The next is a pair of laws that have to do with California consumer privacy. They are called CCPA and CPRA, and you don't have to remember that. But the two of these uh, regulate how businesses worldwide are allowed to handle the personal information of California residents. So the initial law was really um, concerned with companies that sold consumer data that they collected. And the addendum basically covered the, the opening for any website that is accessible to people in California. So these two should be taken as a unit anymore because the CPRA, which is the addendum, that went into effect in January 2023. So where the first one was all about having a privacy policy and a cookie policy that stated how you collected and stored any data and how and if third parties are using it. The CPRA requires that even if you don't sell the data, you are required to be compliant with all of those regulations so that the people in California are protected. So the next two have to do with um, children's online privacy. So the first one is COPA and the second one is CALOPA and it's C-O-P-P-A, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. And these are in the United States and they are enforced by the FTC, which is the Federal Trade Commission. And this was put in place to help protect children's privacy and to keep them safe online. So the regulations require that websites obtain consent from parents before collecting personal information from children under the age of 13. Right. And this would be why things like uh, apps like Instagram and Facebook have an age 13 minimum requirement or uh, you have to be 13 or over or 14 or over, I guess. Um, Also, interestingly, if you've been watching the news lately, again, this episode uh, launches in early April. In March 2023, Italy, the whole country, banned the use of chat 
GPT, the generative AI bot, in the country because of privacy overreach and how the user's uh, data was being used and, and tracked. And it totally went against any of the GDPR and the, um, the OPPA laws. So they banned the use of that entirely. And in the article that I read that talked about Italy's ban, they specifically mentioned the fact that there was absolutely zero protection for minor children using the chat GPT in particular. The other part of the uh, Online Protection Act had to do with the privacy policy itself and the fact that it must use the word privacy and that has to have a direct link from your homepage and it must cover any third-party usage of the data that's collected. So it's kind of specific and nuanced, but again, These are um, things that are really pretty easy to incorporate into your privacy policies. So I don't want to send shivers down anyone's spine. I just uh, uncovered these two different things that I didn't know about with the specific, with the word privacy being uh, linked in your website. So that was kind of interesting. There's another law called the EU cookie law, and it's called the e-privacy directive or the EU cookie directive. And this requires websites to have a dedicated cookie policy and to get consent from users before they could store or retrieve personal information on a computer or a tablet or a smartphone. And this is designed to protect data privacy by making visitors aware of just how much information is being collected by whatever website they're visiting, right? And it allows for an informed choice regarding whether or not that person wants that to happen. So under the GDPR, the EU cookie law, the two California laws, You are legally required to inform users of how you use the cookies that you collect. And you can create a policy, a privacy policy on your website where all this data can be listed out for them. And so things that you're going to be included in your uh, cookie policy and in your privacy policy, you're going to disclose that your site collects and stores cookies. You're going to explain what the cookies are and why your site uses them. You're going to disclose the types of cookies or the third parties that you use. You're going to explain how you collect information using forms and signups and subscriptions. You're going to state why you or a third party collects this information. You're going to inform your users how they can opt in and opt out or customize their cookie experience. You're going to use policy language that makes it accessible and easy to understand. And cookie requirements under the current data privacy laws They strive to give users as much control as possible over their data and how it gets used, right? So, for example, in California, the California laws, consumers are specifically allowed to opt out of both sale data and the sharing of their data. So it's one of those things that it just it makes common sense. But there are specific things like if you're going to be using the Facebook pixel, for example, that has to be disclosed because If you're using data on your website that tracks a user across the internet and then serves ads to them on Facebook and Instagram because they visited your website, well, that's a third-party cookie, right? That's something that you have to disclose. So although GDPR and the EU cookie laws are based in the EU, they apply to all businesses that do or can potentially market to EU customers. Okay, so this means that you have to be transparent. You have to have a cookie policy, whether you're based in the U.S. or in the EU. And you have to have consent requirements for any of the data that you collect that covers from GDPR and the cookies. Right. So the thing that is different about GDPR and any other laws is GDPR require. There's no implied consent. They must actually opt in. So that's something to be aware of. Another one that doesn't apply to all businesses, but I think it's important to include and absolutely discuss in any conversation about uh, policies is the ADA, right? The Americans with Disabilities Act. This requires in certain state uh, situations, there are going to be laws where certain websites have to have standards for accessibility for users with a disability. Right. And this means that all electronic information and technology, including your website, must be accessible to people with disabilities. So the ADA doesn't specifically mention websites or digital accessibility 
in the actual code of the law. But the DOJ, the um, the U.S. Department of Justice, has stated that websites qualify as, quote, places of public accommodation. So if your website is not accessible to people with disabilities and it's not compliant with the law, and I would just like to add to the topic of accessibility, whether or not this law exists in your jurisdiction, like whether or not you are covered by the ADA because you're in the States or if you're in the EU or in any other country for that matter, you know, I don't think we need a law to tell us that we need to make our websites accessible. I think that it's just good business and it's it's being a good human, right? We're being good citizens of the world when we make sure that the people of all abilities and any disability can use our website effectively, right? So if you're unsure of how to proceed with this, you can research um, online and get loads and loads of help on specific examples on how to make your website more accessible. Um, and this is accessible to people who are blind, who and you can build in um, things that will read images uh, and links to users. And uh, like, there's just there's so many different ways to become compliant for people with um, accessibility needs. And some of those examples are larger fonts. There's web reading tools. There's providing transcripts for videos. There's written descriptions behind images. There's clear contrast between fonts, colors, and the backgrounds that they appear on, right? And these accommodations can be helpful to everyone, and they ensure that no individual gets discriminated against based on a disability, right? Whether or not it's intended. So every website belonging to a business uh, needs to be needs to take care of this and be mindful of this. Um, but I do believe that. If you have 15 or more employees and you're based in the U.S. and you're open for more than half the year, you must comply with the ADA, which I think that's kind of silly that they make that stipulation. But that covers um, a lot of the data requirements. And so then I wanted to go on and talk about some policy documents. So there are things that you need to be using on your website that just provide a safety net for yourself. And also, you know, common courtesy for your users. And I'm talking about things like terms of use, terms and conditions, shipping policies, return policies, and especially if you're selling anything from your website, but they become expected anymore. And, you know, things like a contact form and an about page, all of these things are just good business, right? You want to make sure that you do these things. Anytime you can put a policy in place. To handle something that arises, it makes it that much simpler to handle it the next time it comes, right? And it also takes any kind of hemming and hawing and personal touch out of how you're going to handle a certain situation, right? So policies protect everybody. So think about your policy documents as living documents, meaning that they are on your list to be updated and revisited regularly. And this is like quarterly or you know monthly, depending on what you're doing. And I'll give you a great example of this. I have a girlfriend who owns rental properties and she has a lease for her tenants that's in place. And it's part of the whole app situation that when they, when they apply and sign their lease, the lease sits in an app. But anytime something comes up that is possibly problematic or it wasn't explicitly explained in the lease or, you know, it didn't protect her or it didn't protect them properly. Anytime she's made aware of that, she goes in and she makes a note for herself and she goes back into her template for her lease, which is not now the active lease because the active lease has been signed and executed and that's now a static document. But she has a template lease that sits in a folder and she sits down in any single thing that she needs to make a change on. She, she does that on a regular basis so that when the new tenant comes in, all of those issues are already laid out in black and white for that next tenant and all future tenants. And as things come up. She continues to make changes to this document so that she will never have to think about it again because you don't know until you know, right? So this is what I mean about treating your policy documents like a living document. So if you have something like a return policy and you have a weird situation that comes up and it's, it sounds like a one-off, but you know you had to figure out how to handle it, well, then you can put that language into your return policy document so that the next time somebody makes a purchase, you know, they're covered by this new version of that document and that you know how to handle everything that comes. So I don't think that that can be treated too lightly, right? 
So while I'm on the topic of policy documents, you should never copy a policy document from another website. The policy documents on a website were probably created using a service or a law firm, and those are protected by copyright and licenses. So there are lots of apps and services out there that you can use to help you create your own set of policy documents online. A lot of them are free. A lot of them are available for a nominal cost, but you need to be very mindful of the fact that the copy on a website, text that's on a website in a policy document is not something that's available for you to just copy and use. Um, And be wary of that because there are more and more and more bots out there that are built just to troll the internet for this use. And if you get tapped and you find that you've used something that didn't belong to you, you can get in trouble for that. So that brings me to copyright and plagiarism. So original content is automatically copyrighted, regardless of whether or not it's been officially registered with a copyright office or anything like that. Any unauthorized, unattributed use of another website's original content can be flagged and considered plagiarism and or copyright infringement. So this extends to anything that can be borrowed from another website, but it also affects images that have been downloaded from the web and even from sites like Google Images that seem like they're set up for you to borrow images from. And I'm going to take a moment here to really hammer this one home because um, it's, it's especially serious with images in particular. But there are actually law firms that act like uh, collection agencies for this, and they handle these kinds of claims. There is technology available that will allow them to do like massive reverse images searches, as well as for text, of course, but I'm specifically talking about images. And they could find an image on the web, no matter how small or obscure or, you know, random the one single use is, right? This is intellectual property. It belongs to somebody else. And if you don't have the license to use it, then you are liable. Ask me how I know. I used to blog. I was a a blogger like for years and years and years. And I grabbed an image. This is 10 years ago now. I grabbed an image off of, uh, you know, Google, did a search for an image and used it on my website. I used to do uh, these blogs on obscure words. And I did it so long ago and it was so random. I forgot all about it, but they found me and they, I had to go and take care of this. And so it was not fun. It was not cheap. And it was, you know, they didn't care that it was, you know, a blogspot blog. Like it doesn't matter. The, the fact is that either you own the images or you don't own the images. So if you take nothing else away from this episode, I want you to take this away. So if you're doing something else, I want you to stop and I want you to listen to what I'm saying to you. If you have any images on your website, on your blog that don't belong to you, meaning that you didn't take them and that you didn't purchase the license to to them, or you don't have the license to them through a, a creator, you should remove them from your website today. You should only use images and copy that you've created or that you legally own. And again, it doesn't matter how long it's been there. Like you're not safe if you say that you've had this website for 15 years and this thing is the first thing you posted and it's no one's ever come for you yet. That's not going to protect you. And whether or not you have a really busy website is irrelevant to the fact that you don't have the right to use the images. So if you didn't take it, create it or buy it, you don't have the right to use it. And, um, you know, if the best way to do this, the way that I did it after I got smacked was I went into my, uh, I use WordPress now, but I went into my blogspot media file and I went into my, uh, WordPress media folder. And I went through just every single image in those folders, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And anything that I did not take myself or create myself, I just deleted it. And I went back through over time and, you know, for blog posts, I didn't worry so much about old, old blog posts with replacing the image with something else because the chances of the blog post itself being read were like slim to none. But the fact that the images were there were the problem, right? Because the bots don't care who's seeing the page and if it's coming up in search, in search engines. So 
that's my soapbox. Uh, I would like you to make sure that you are as compliant as possible because that one, it, it doesn't matter who you are. The bots will find you. Alternatively, there is content licensing and attribution, right? So these are sites that produce professional content that you can license for use on your own website. This is like PLR, like the private license and rights, uh, you know, ghostwritten content. So this can include anything from pictures to videos to audio to graphics to, you know, music, logos, anything. And whenever you do uh, purchase any kind of third party created content, make sure that you have a folder on your computer or on your Google Drive, wherever you store your stuff, just for content licensing. You want to save those licenses and you want to make sure that you label them so that you remember what they are and where they came from. Um, and in particular, this is something that I do uh, on a regular basis, actually, whenever I purchase uh, stock photography from a site like Deposit Photos, for example, I will download a copy of the license, the user license, and I will also screenshot it and I will file that in my folder with the date of that. Because usually I will download batches of pictures for use in a project because the privacy, the not the privacy policies, the 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 user licenses could change. And I want to make sure that I grab the one that was live at the time because the policy itself is sitting on their website. You know, you it's it, it could be a live document for all we know. So protect yourself when it comes to licensing of anything, especially things that you're going to use in your media. So the third area, so the first one we talked about was all the data privacy stuff, right? The second one was all about um, policy documents. And my third department where I want to cover things that you're going to use on your website is all about disclaimers, right? One of the most common disclaimers on websites expressly disclaims responsibilities for actions users take based on the site's content, right? These disclaimers are like, you know, don't, don't do this at home. They can be separated into their own section or they can be part of your terms and conditions, right? Areas where you may want a disclaimer. Well, liability for third-party advertisers, including affiliate links, right? How many times have we heard about, you know, companies being affiliated with another company and then like one of them gets canceled and the other one's like, oh, you know, guilty by association. So you want to make sure that you disclaim liability for anything going on with an advertiser on your site or any affiliate links that you're using. You could state that the site's content is for informational purposes only and not professional advice like I did with this podcast, stating that I was not a lawyer and that you shouldn't take this as legal advice and do your due diligence, right? So that's an informational purpose. You can state that users uh, cannot use your original content without permission, which that goes without saying, but stating it might make it clearer because I don't know that it's something that everybody really understands. I think that they think that it's out there and therefore they can just have it. And, you know, it's just one of those things that you just, you just can't do it. Uh, if you are a general contractor or a subcontractor, you should have your licensing credentials on display on your website. And I was not able to find any laws that govern this in particular. So this might be one that varies based on your location. So you should do your research on that one. Um, if you have any kind of credential or license that uh, needs to be displayed. So other policy documents and disclaimers that you want to have on your website are terms and conditions and terms of use. So these are policies that set the rules for your website. It could cover things like billing and pricing and shipping and returns so that customers know what to expect and that you know how to handle requests. If your website uses third-party information, the terms and conditions could clearly state that you're not responsible for the accuracy of third-party statements, nor do you endorse third-party statements or actions. And this can also be useful in uh, setting disclaimers for limiting liability and establishing where and how disputes would be settled. Uh, shipping, return, and refund policies for e-commerce websites are really important. And they outline the specific requirements for how, when, and under what circumstances shoppers can uh, ship or return their purchased items and whether or not refunds are automatically provided. Uh, and this, you know, 
if you have all these policy documents, especially for e-commerce, it makes the inclusion of clear and straightforward rules all the more important, right? You're selling stuff online. You're selling products and services. You want to make sure that the people that are using your services and, your, and buying your products understand what's expected and, and you understand what their expectations are based on your policies, right? Effective policies show your customers that you value their satisfaction with your products and services, right? That's the bottom line. We need to let our visitors know that we are aware that they require protection and care, right? So to ensure compliance with state, federal, and international laws, it's crucial to be transparent with your users, right? So keep your privacy and cookie policies and your terms of service easy and simple, right? You want them easy to understand. You want your users to appreciate how clear and, you know, easy they are to read and to, to navigate. It's also important to follow industry standards and international laws for your websites, right? A legally compliant website creates a safer environment for you, and it also fosters a stronger customer's trust and loyalty. So I realize that this was a super dense episode, but it's becoming more and more important as time goes on and data privacy in particular becomes ever more important to people, including us. Like we're business owners and we are users and citizens of the world using the web. So if you're interested in learning more, I'm going to be hosting a masterclass on getting your website compliant, where I will walk you through all the things that you need. So to sign up for this, to be notified when it's available, go to my show notes page, which is at corinnoflynn.com forward slash episode 15, which is the word episode and the digits one five, and you can get your name on the list. And that's it. That's all I have for you this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. And I hope I didn't, uh, Kaja to glaze over with the density of this one, but um, it's really important that we all uh, we all do the right thing and and maintain the the rules of law and compliance and keep ourselves and all of our customers safe. Thanks for listening. Remember, part of being a calm entrepreneur is developing the systems, habits, and know how that lets you know that you are the one in the driver's seat. You get to choose how you run your business and you get to choose how you work. So you got this. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of the Calm Entrepreneur Podcast. I'm Corinne O'Flynn. And if this episode was valuable to you, please head on over and rate and review wherever you consume your podcasts. Please subscribe so you'll never miss an episode. New episodes go out each week on Tuesdays and I look forward to hanging with you again. This is Corinne signing off. Have an excellent day.